Fox and NBC5 first warning weather alert. Good morning once again. I'm Zuri Hoffman. We're standing by for Vermont Governor Phil Scott to give the latest update on recovery efforts following historic flooding across the state. This comes as another line of storms is expected later today. Let's listen in. Now I was joined by the FEMA administrator to evaluate damage and to turn the lights back on <laughs> as we pre prepare for the recovery phase. Today, I will submit a request to President Biden for a major disaster declaration, which if approved, would provide federal disaster relief funds, which will be very helpful to communities in the recovery phase. That request will be reviewed by FEMA and then given to the president for his approval. To be clear, the disaster declaration provides federal support for recovery. It's separate from and in addition to the federal emergency declaration the president already signed uh, when he was overseas to help with the initial emergency phase. The disaster declaration is one of the reasons it was important to have the administrator and members of her team here yesterday to see the enormous needs we have as we move forward. Next, unfortunately, in parts of the state, we're now expecting severe thunderstorms, which could bring more flash flooding, hail, and even the threat of a tornado. Those are expected to come late this afternoon into the evening hours. So Vermonters need to pay attention to the weather reporting today and plan ahead. If you need to do something today, do it early. Don't wait until tonight. Flash flooding can happen quickly and you don't know when it could hit. As most of us have been doing, we used a lull in the rain yesterday to prepare for what might be coming today and tomorrow, which Secretary Flynn and Commissioner Morrison will talk about more shortly. And again, I want to reiterate, this isn't over, and it won't be over after this storm. On Sunday, unfortunately, there's another chance for heavy rain statewide. I know this is hard news for many, and folks will want to think this is over as soon as the weather breaks on Saturday, but it's critical that Vermonters understand that we need to remain vigilant and prepared. Do not be complacent. And as a reminder, be smart and use common sense. That means do not go in the water. We've seen many pictures on social media of kids swimming in floodwaters. This is not typical rainwater. It's filled with chemicals, oil, waste, and more. It's simply not safe. Also, please continue to follow road closure signs. Do not put yourself in a position where rescue teams are diverted and put at risk themselves because you decided to take a chance. I assure you though, we'll get through this and we'll be stronger for it. But for the time being, we still need to focus on the response and prepare for whatever comes our way over the next couple of days. And then we can move full time into the recovery stage. With that, I'll now turn it over to Commissioner Morrison. Thank you, Governor. Good morning. Thank you for being here to help us get important information out to Vermonters. I will provide information on the status of current operations, an overview of planning for anticipated hazards, and various other updates, many of which might sound very much like what you just heard from the governor, but they are so important we will be echoing some of his remarks. There are no active rescue missions ongoing at this time. Our teams wrapped up yesterday's work shortly before 1 a.m. today and after a short rest break have been working on pre-positioning swift water and urban search and rescue assets for the next round of storms. We also have National Guard assets on standby. As of now, there are no reported fatalities. I'd like to provide some information on uh, some of the shelters that are open in the state. This list does not include locally operated shelters. There are four American Red Cross regional shelters. In Barrie, there are 25 people in shelter. In Rutland, there are four. In White River Junction slash Hartford, there are zero. 
And at Northern Vermont University on the Johnson campus, there are 15 where a Red Cross trailer has been deployed to support that uh, university site. There are two independent shelters, and their status report is this. At the Fox Run Golf Club in Ludlow, there are six people in shelter. And at Smuggler's Notch, there are 59. There are numerous other shelters that are on standby and prepared to open if there is a need. The big news today, as the governor said, is upcoming severe weather later today and then again on Sunday. Specifically, there is dangerous weather forecasted for most of the state between 4 p.m. and 8 p.m. today. This round of storms could contain severe thunderstorms with rain, lightning, and hail, and as the governor said, the possibility, particularly in the western part of the state, of a tornado. The likelihood of localized flash flooding is high. This is not expected to be a repeat of Monday and Tuesday, but it will be dangerous in the areas that experience flash flooding. People working outside should remain alert, have a plan, and stay in tune with weather warnings. We are working around the clock to keep Vermont safe. Even as we maintain a response-ready posture, we are simultaneously preparing for the emerging threats and later for recovery efforts. We are repositioning assets, communicating with our local partners, providing guidance to address known risks, and more. We are preparing, and we ask that you do the same. Let's get through tonight's storm safely so that we can pivot our attention to the recovery and preparing for yet another round of dangerous weather on Sunday. Here are some things that you can do to prepare. Plan ahead. Please see vem.vermont.gov forward slash preparedness for details on how to prepare. There's a lot of resources on the Vermont Emergency Management page. Remain alert to weather conditions and warnings issued by the National Weather Service. If you have not yet signed up for VT alerts, please do so at vtalert.gov. If you see storm waters approaching, turn around and seek higher ground. Stay away from swollen rivers and waterways. The photo ops are just not worth the risk. Maintain situational awareness and have a plan if you find yourself in a storm-stricken area. Just because you may have fared well on the last round of storms does not mean you are immune to future danger. As the governor said, between four and eight is the most dangerous time for Vermonters today. Don't be outside running on the roadways or doing your errands then if you don't have to be. Heed this advice. Predictable is preventable. Today's threat is predictable. Please do not put yourself or your family at unnecessary risk. And please do not put our first responder family at risk. Take care of yourselves and stay out of harm's way. And while I'm talking about families and putting people at risk, I have to echo what the governor said about storm waters. They are filled with oil, gas, sewage, chemicals, and more. They are foul and nasty. Do not let your kids play in storm water. It's not healthy. I want to wrap up by sending sincere appreciation to all who are working in our local, regional, and our state emergency operations centers. Additionally, I'd like to thank the National Weather Service, the Red Cross, 211, Serve Vermont, and all of our incredible partners. There are too many to list, but all of our incredible partners who are staffing the EOCs around the clock and keeping us up to date and ready to respond and ready to recover. Uh, Deputy Commissioner Batesy will be here uh, following this presser for questions, and now I am turning it over to me, <laughs> Deputy Secretary Gendron. Hi, good morning. Um, my name is Maggie Gendron, and I'm the Deputy Secretary for the Agency of Natural Resources, and I have with me today Eric Blatt, who is our lead engineer for the dam safety program at the Agency of Natural Resources. The agency manages 100 state-owned dams, and we um, regulate about 800 private and municipal-owned dams. Our first and foremost priority right now is still the public safety and health of Vermont's communities, and so our attention is really focused on three flood control dams on the Winooski, which is in Waterbury, the Wrightsville Dam, and Eastbury Dam. I talked a little bit about this today. 
but we have uh, full staffing at the Waterbury Dam and Wrightsville Dam, and we are periodically monitoring the Eastbury uh, Dam. So when it comes to Waterbury, our chief dam safety engineer is operating the dam in real time to maximize the flood storage there. We are monitoring closely so that if the Winooski rises to a certain height, we know to close the gates and to inform our Vermont emergency management folks. We are also engaged with the Army Corps of Engineers and a consultant that are familiar with the operation of those three dams. And they are working with us on completing the modeling that they provided to assess the impact of different levels of rainfalls on the ability of the dams to store water. This is really important information that we can then provide the Vermont Emergency Management and the towns downstream, which is all the way to Bolton, so that we can make good decisions based on how the weather shifts. Right now, this is an important message for you to take away, please. Right now, based on the current forecasted weather and the modeling, it is unlikely that we will have water flow over the spillway at, Re at Wrightsville. Um, and this has not occurred to date. So we are incredibly unfortunate that the integrity of our dams have withstood these storms. And I would also like to put in another plug for Vermont, Alert, Vermont Alerts, which has been an incredibly successful system in alerting Vermonters of real-time information that they need to know. Um, the Agency of Natural Resources also has a dedicated flood page that gives Vermonters all kinds of information that they need to know from pumping out your basements to hazardous material and waste disposal. So thank you very much, and that is all I have today. Good morning. Before I go through the list of accomplishments um, and losses for VTRANS, I want to speak to two things. First, I want to correct a comment I made yesterday, which was that the floating bridge in Brookfield was gone. I was wrong. Um, how that came about was our management center, our transportation management center, received a call from a local citizen who said they couldn't see the bridge. It looks gone. We dispatched the district person down there. This is, of course, amidst a rainstorm. And in fact, what the case was is the bridge had inverted and it wasn't on the upside floating, so it looked like it had sunk or disappeared. Um, but I take full responsibility for that statement. The good news is the bridge is not destroyed nor gone. The second thing I'd like to address uh, that just came to my attention this morning is a video that some of you may have seen of a VTRANS dump truck in high water after we have been talking about not driving in high water. When I saw the video, it clearly is not a flattering video, but a little background. We were dispatching five vehicles to an intersection in Cambridge, and I can get you that exact intersection location if you wish, earlier that day to ensure no one else traveled to that intersection. Our crew was caught in a flash flood in rapidly rising water. Four of the five vehicles were able to back away and take refuge in and out of residents, local homes, who had allowed them to use restrooms, gave them water, and whatnot. The truck in that video was trapped for 30 hours, the driver in the truck. The morning that you see that that video was taken, under the supervision of the uh, manager for the region, and I take full responsibility and agree with what he did, through the radio, he was trying to alert the driver on how to extricate himself. But I do have to admit, it seems contrary to the guidance we're providing people, and I felt it important to explain that because it's on social media. Happy to have any other questions offline after that. Now on to some current items. We are working with 31 private contractors now around the state. They are working with VTRANS, and I thank them for their efforts, and I'm certain there will be more. Our crews have been working through the night to prepare for the weather that you've heard both the Governor and Commissioner Morrison talk about, and Secretary Gendron. Our priority for the day today is to harden everything we can as quickly as possible, to remove current obstructions, armor banks, armor slide areas, and prepare for what is forecasted to come our way. Our crews as well will heed the warning about the time of day that will be the most severe. And I would reiterate what my colleagues have said. Vermonters need to pay attention, especially later this afternoon. 
Don't be out doing anything you don't need to be doing. BTRANS is also moving equipment from areas of the state that are encountering lower damages to areas in support of their other garages which have had higher damage. Our facilities report, our central garage complex at the bottom of Hospital Hill, including the, the BTRANS Training Center and the District 6 Capital Region offices have received significant water damage and are not inhabitable. Central Garage, which is our maintenance work on our vehicles, you may see a lot of vehicles parked up here. We brought them here before the flood. We were unable to get two vehicles out and they were lost in the flood. Central Garage will temporarily, temporarily relocate to the Knapp Airport and staff will work out of the Knapp Airport terminal. Roads, as of 7 a.m. this morning, 24 roads remain closed. A significant drop from yesterday and a significant drop from our first report, which I believe I reported 81 at that time. Again, these are state roads. Eight roads remain partially closed or partially open, depending on whether your glass is half full or open. I'd like to say partially open. One lane restrictions. 28 roads have opened, reopened in the last 24 hours since we spoke. We are working feverishly today on U.S. Route 2. It may become passable, but at extremely low speeds. And I will say that heavy rain absolutely makes a mess of every effort to recover a gravel road. It just does. It washes away the material, expo it exposes the aggregate, so we will follow the guidance on Fine One One. I urge you to um, have your viewers and listeners go to Five One One. We are updating that by the minute, literally, um, as to the conditions on US Two. For mileage reports, completely closed state roads, 62.7 miles. Partially open state roads, 24 and a half miles. Fully open since the start of the storm, or fully restored, 172 miles. And I can give anyone who cares at another time based on districts and where those are more specifics. Bridges. Yesterday you heard me speak about inspecting bridges. We inspected 49 bridges yesterday during throughout the storm. There, there will be minor repairs necessary on several bridges, but as I said yesterday, the currently only significant bridge damage on the state network is in Vershire. And we are working with a contractor to put in a temporary bridge at that location. I reserve the right to hold on until after we know what the weather tomorrow and Sunday bring, but we are shooting for the 24th to restore mobility. But again, please put an asterisk next to that statement. We did have to close bridge 42 on Vermont 30 in Jamaica yesterday. That was not damaged to the point where it was closed initially, but we needed to close it upon inspection. We will have to do some work there to assess when that can be reopened. Currently, the water level is too high and it's too dangerous for inspectors to do much more at that point. Rail. All rail trails continue to be closed. The Washington County Railroad line, which runs from White River Junction to Newport, has now been fully inspected. And I'm pleased to report there is not much damage. What is there can be managed. The Vermont Rail Systems is going to conduct repairs and open the line up, we hope, uh, tomorrow from Barton to Newport. From Barrie to Montpelier on the Wacker, the site inspections continue today. As I reported yesterday, there's significant damage. We don't yet have a timeline for reestablishing service. The VTR line between Burlington and Rutland has now been fully inspected. Vermont Rail Systems is hoping to provide more concrete information, but with luck, that should possibly be addressed and reopened this weekend. As soon as that is done, the Amtrak train set, which has been stranded in Burlington, will leave, but that is not saying Amtrak will have restored service. At that point, Amtrak would like to get that train out of here until everything is fully restored across its network. 
The Green Mountain Railroad between Rutland and Bellis Falls, as I have been reporting, remains the railroad line with the greatest amount of damage. At this time, I do not have an assessment as to when that will be fully restored, but there is significant damage in places along that uh, line. And the CP, Canadian Pacific, uh, which runs through Newport to Richford, Vermont, and obviously originates in Quebec, um, has some damage as well. Heavy railroad equipment is being brought in to conduct repairs for that. All 10 Vermont State Airports are fully functional. Clearly, there's some additional operations occurring across the street at Knapp, as you see. And for the two uh, dams that VTrans owns, there are no issues. Thank you. Thank you all. Uh, we'll now open it up to questions. Governor. For the governor, so you mentioned the emergency declaration that FEMA has to look over and then send it to Biden. I guess, do you have any type of timeline of when the federal resources could be coming here and how long that process is going to take? We don't know exactly, but it um, but it will open the door uh, almost immediately uh, for help to arrive, and that's why, as I said before, it was so important for the administrator to come uh, at uh, the request of the president uh, to make sure she saw for herself uh, the damage uh, that we we had uh, we are seeing ourselves. So um, it will be, I, I would say, it'd be fairly quick, but um, but it's up to them. Can you explain? Yeah, I mean, we, we declared a state of emergency ourselves, uh, for that's a state emergency that opens up resources that we can utilize within the state. Um, so the, the federal government, the, the president, uh, signed another emergency declaration, seeing that there's an emergency in the state uh, that opened up some resources as well. This uh, request is something that's typically after uh, the initial emergency uh, when you're in recovery. Um, and that takes a little bit of time. But uh, because of the severity of damage here in the state and the likelihood that we will get uh, and meet those thresholds, uh, they advise uh, that uh, why don't you go ahead and request it now, uh, and that way we can get through some of the, the paperwork, so to speak, so we can get the help to those in need. So it was part of their um, um, advice uh, to, to move forward with that. And that's why, again, she came, uh, she came up on quick notice. Uh, the president wanted to make sure uh, that uh, they were doing all they could to help us. So it's infrastructure help as well as residential and business? Yeah, help? it'll open up a lot of other resources, and I don't have them all, and we can go through those if it, when, it, when and if um, it is signed. Um, but it does open up the door to many more resources uh, in, in the recovery phase. Because the initial declaration did not cover not, residential, right? right? Not everything, right? Uh, so uh, typically, again, it's just to um, open up resources uh, for the emergency itself. And then think about that in terms of different phases, emergency and recovery. Governor, how much? Roughly, how much money are we talking about here? I, I, I would not dare um, give you that information because I don't know. I mean, it, it would it would just be a guess, and I don't think I should be guessing from the podium um, because we there are there's so much damage that we haven't seen yet locally um, that uh, and so much residential damage and business damage and so forth and agriculture uh, and not that this you know that's separate, but Again, in totality, uh, it's significant. The FEMA person yesterday told me that basically it's a 25% share, more or less, from the state. Is there money set aside in the budget or in the state reserve something now in anticipation of that, or would this just be all new? State money? Yeah, I'm, I mean, we do have rainy day funds um, and, uh, and other funding that we can move around, but. Um, you know, this wasn't something we planned for. So, can Clouds, would you want to answer? Sure. So, it, it depends on the amount of damage. Um, there's a threshold where match becomes a 10% match as opposed to a 25% match. We'll determine whether or not we exceed that threshold once we have a better idea of the damage. 
We do have $15 million set aside in the FEMA reserve that was approved in this budget by this legislature. Um, and we can certainly utilize portions of that money if necessary. Much of that money was reserved for FEMA claims that have already been made and may be denied. So it's yet to be determined if that money will be available. But that's certainly a start. That 25 or 4 to 10% match, will that be entirely state funded or will it be shared with local For, um, well, it depends on what pot of FEMA would be available, but for, for the state section, it would be entirely state shared. And we can't use insurance proceeds towards that match payment. And not asking what the dollar amount is, way too early, but who determines the dollar amount? Is that the feds or does the state throw out a number and they, how does that work? Do you want to? I can, we can have uh, maybe Eric. It's a joint effort. So we have AOT district techs out. Uh, they're doing their damage assessments. We have what's called a local liaison activation. So we use our local regional planning commissions. We'll reach out to the towns for information. We'll generate um, data sets from 211 individual call-ins. And then we actually have teams coming in from FEMA either tonight or tomorrow who will out, go out door to door uh, speaking with individuals about it and looking at the damage assessments. So it's a multi-track um, uh, process. Would you mind just introducing Okay. I'm Eric Foran. I'm the director of Vermont Emergency Management. Thank you. Back to the residential question. Um, I mean, do you have a message for people right now as far as what they can expect? If, if yeah, again, I, I don't want to uh, give any information out that I'm not 100% sure of, um, but that will be coming shortly, hopefully, once the and we're working on that to make sure that we simplify that so that and, and everyone has an understanding what it covers what it doesn't and what they can expect uh, we're also working closely we're we're reaching out today uh, our team is with the treasurer and others to see what funding is available so that we can provide relief uh, in anticipation of some federal help uh, if it gets signed so that people aren't waiting for that check um, so we're working through all of that. Um, again, we're trying to deal with the, the initial emergency response at this point uh, in having one, uh, one foot into recovery. Uh, and, um, but we're trying to take care of the emergency first. Uh, but at the same time, we've got our teams working together to try and anticipate some of that. But I, I, um, we'll have more detail on that once it's, uh, once it's signed. Do we have a sense of how many residences around the state have been damaged? I I don't at this point. Eric, do we have anything at, the, at this point? No, we're yeah. still collecting yeah. all those data points. Governor, with some of the uh, bigger impacts of this work coming later today and tonight, 211, as I understand, is still closed from 11 p.m. to 8 a.m. Where should people be turning or, or reaching out to? Uh, if they need help, or is that a 911 yeah. question? Yeah, well, it, 211, of course, first, um, and you should anticipate that. Uh, but if it's if it's after, like, 8 p.m. during the evening hours, late overnight hours, it's probably a mer an emergency anyhow. Um, so call 911. For ANR, um, can you tell us a little bit how communications have gone with um, between the agency and private? Sure. So we have just completed outreach to, like I said, the um, of the dams that are municipal and privately owned. We have completed outreach and we're having a back and forth conversation. So it's going to be an ongoing conversation. It's the responsibility of private dam owners to monitor their dams and report out to emergency management if there are any issues. Um, so, so far, do, there are none so far. So. What makes you, uh, I don't know if optimistic is the right word, you were talking about the rights of the dam. I would say reduced risk. So we have to be vigilant and monitoring the weather. However, um, like I said, with the uh, Army Corps of Engineers and the contractor that we worked with, we completed essentially a modeling assessment that gives us um, predictions of downstream impacts based on, you know, the weather so one inches of rain two inches of rain three inches of rain four inches of rain so that gives us information as data points to then provide that back to emergency management and towns downstream so that they have an understanding of what those downstream impacts would be if the weather changes but as of right now 
based on the forecast and the modeling, it does it looks unlikely that there will be a spillover of Brightsville. I know earlier you said it's unlikely. Was there maybe like a key number you have highlighted or circled where it does get to this point up to a certain um, I I don't know the answer to that. I'm sure our I'm sure Eric does. Sure. Come to the podium, please. Hello, everybody. Uh, Eric Platt, uh, Director of Engineering with our DAMS program. Uh, we, we, are, we have somebody stationed up at Wrightsville, and they are monitoring the level in the, in the dam. Uh, so far, no water has passed over the spillway. And just so people have a sense of the proportion of this dam, the, the actual crest of the dam is 30 feet higher than the spillway. So there's sufficient storage in the dam. Uh, as if, if the dam um, spillway passes water, um, we have inundation maps, flood maps, uh, based on different scenarios. That information is going to be disseminated to emergency management directors all the way down to Bolt. So they, we will keep them informed as to the level. So there's the spillway. And then above that are the floodgates, and then there are no for Wrightsville. There are no floodgates. Um, so we manage three um, flood control dams on the, on the Winooski River, as mentioned earlier. Um, Waterbury Dam is the only one of the three where there's actual gate operation to to manage uh, the flood level. And, and right now with the Waterbury Dam, we're we're lowering the water level to increase the amount of Flood storage. You mentioned 30 feet above. I, I just so with the Wrightsville Dam, uh, the the spillway it's an auxiliary spillway. It only passes water when when the level rises to six in this case 685. Um, and the um, the dam itself, the crest of the dam, is 30 feet higher than the spillway. Okay. Create an image. Think of it as a large vessel with an opening in it that's 30 feet below the top of the crest of the dam. So, so that folks understand this, if, if the water was within about a foot of this spillway before, is that right? Is that where it remains today? It's, it's in that range. It's about two feet, I think, below the spillway. It's, and it's dropping, but it's dropping very slowly. Would, would releasing some of the water through the spillway cause an immediate evacuation downstream? Um, no, I don't think in just some water spilling over. Um, the modeling that we're doing is establishing the amount of flooding that will occur based on different scenarios. Um, and I, I don't have that information readily available to me. Our dam safety engineer and the engineer that's monitoring has that information and is communicating with our both the core and our contractor, our engineering consultant that is familiar with the operation of that dam, who is doing actual modeling. When we had the flooding in Montpelier, when there was standing water on Main Street and State Street and so forth, then it was more of a concern than it would be today. Like this is a, you know, if it, get, if it got to the spillway, for instance, and there's no flooding in Montpelier, there would be a, a, an amount of water going over the spillway coming down through uh, the stream into the Winooski. So that's concerning, but not as concerning as it was when it was flood, flooded the waterways or flooded the streets and so forth. Is that yes, uh, the level in the Winooski River and the Dog River have receded, so that takes pressure off the entire system. Governor, you mentioned the restoration of state roads. What's the process for local roads? Where is that contingent on federal funding? Well, local roads are being uh, um, rebuilt and uh, by the local uh, authorities, maintenance uh, districts, and so forth. We are assisting in any way we can. I might have Joe um, um, offer any other information on that but that's ongoing and we don't have uh, we don't have all the numbers on that uh, we're keeping track of the state roads um, and we're uh, obviously uh, going to have to include that uh, in any of the, the FEMA uh, requests that we have in terms of uh, dollars but um, again I know many of the crews uh, local crews are very busy in, in that regard 
in some of the you know cities uh, as well. Thank you, Governor. So the agency, as I said a few days ago, makes contacts with all of the towns within each region and within each district. We have um, clear, close to 80 actual garages throughout nine districts and five regions that I mentioned the other day. As of this morning, I have no knowledge of a town yet requesting any specific assets or materials from the agency, but our policy is to loan, lend anything we can. You may recall a year and a half ago at Christmas when Shalott lost their garage to fire, we gave three trucks to Shalott for the winter. That's an example of our relationship with communities. So if we were to get a call from a town that said, you know, road X is broken and we can't get to the bottom of it to start fixing it, but we could get to the bottom of it and start fixing it at VTrans, we would try to do that based on wherever that is in Vermont and what our crews are facing on the state highway system at that time. So we work closely. It's generally, the process is that the town reaches out to the State Emergency Operations Center and would say that they've exhausted their resources and capability and they need assistance from AOT. And if we get that call, or even if we hear it anecdotally, we will provide every bit of assistance as we are able to. And, and how is that funded? I mean, I know right. local roads are right. funded through town meeting day budgets. So what, how does that work? So that's a great question. Um, we, would, we would have to keep copious records and copious notes on any work we do on a local highway system because, as the governor has said, that's part of FEMA public assistance. The work we do on the state highway system is funded by the Federal Highway Administration, which is a completely different rubric, if you will. And, and that's already ongoing. So anything we do to help towns, we just document. But, but the local, local communities will get, be reimbursed by Correct. By FEMA. Correct. So, but if we incur expenses, I mean, you know, we're, we're not going to nickel and dime anybody for hours of operation of a dump truck or our employee or something, but, um, you know, if we were pulling material on behalf of the town from a pit, let's say, in that town, we would keep track of that so the town could roll that up into the FEMA documentation. But our, our system, our state roads, everything I've spoken about, national highway system, all the Vermont route numbers, U.S. route numbers, and the interstates are all funded by FHWA. The governor, or she still is very well. Uh, just how many uh, states at this point have sort of water teams here, and are they staying, or like what's the who's on the ground? Yeah, we're very fortunate. I have Dan uh, come up, and maybe he can give the list. But um, we're very fortunate to have them here um, from many many different states, and uh, to offer their assistance. So uh, without them, uh, and we built our. Swift water teams over the last uh, 10 to 12 years. I remember when I was in the Senate, we had, I think it was one swift water team, and that was Mike Cannon out of uh, Colchester. Um, so we've, uh, we were proactive over the years and uh, built that up, and, uh, and, and rightfully so. But uh, without the other teams, we'd be, we'd be challenged right now. Dan? Thank you, Governor. Uh, Dan Batesy, I'm the Deputy Commissioner of Public Safety. Uh, there are, uh, I'd like to follow up with you and give you the exact locations in the states that we're talking about. Uh, there are six states that have contributed thus far. Um, they are uh, in various stages of readiness at this point. I know that we have returned a couple of New Hampshire teams back across the border as they were dealing with some of their own issues. We have a federal team that came out of Massachusetts, so we'll count them as federal, but they're from Massachusetts. Um, but I'd be happy to follow up with you on the exact states that we brought them from. Inspectors. I saw some apartment buildings in Barrie yesterday that the, the water cut around the foundation. It looked unsafe. Yeah, right. yeah. We're we're working with them. I'll have to answer that. But we're working with them uh, to try and assist to get them back in safely as soon as possible. The Division of Fire Safety has deployed its own emergency operations center uh, and is massing resources, uh, in particular around inspectors. We're also taking a look at uh, a number of uh, regulatory issues that we'll have to navigate through that with the idea of smoothing the process to allow for as swift, uh, the, the, the swift deployment of those resources. So there is a, a, an active process going on with those inspectors. Uh, 
And what exactly are they inspecting for? Is it structural? Is it mold? Um, so within our purview, it's structural. We have engineers within our USAR teams that we can deploy in that case. Um, electrical is another big one as well. Um, I, I'd want to refer you to the Division of Fire Safety for specific details on that. And again, I'm glad to follow up with you if you like. Uh, but yeah, for yeah. sure. For the governor, obviously yesterday we had quite a few federal officials here. I guess going forward, are there any plans that you would know of any other federal partners or entities coming to Vermont? I am hearing that there may be other officials coming, but I, I, I not today. If I may be so bold, especially with this um, more rain coming, how are you feeling emotionally? Well, again, I, I think um, Vermont has been through this before. Um, we, um, we have proven uh, that uh, when the chips are down, uh, that we help one another out, and we're doing that right now. I, I see, uh, it, you know, we've talked a lot about during the pandemic about breaking down all the silos between agencies and departments, and we're doing just that in this response as well. We did it during Irene, and, uh, and as well, um, we're relying on you know, those private assets as well uh, to, to help out. So, you know, when we, again, uh, when we're impacted, um, we tend to, to come together. And I'm seeing that uh, throughout the state. So it gives me uh, great hope and, uh, and security that we'll make it through this. Uh, I know we will, but we're, we need to, uh, to stick together and listen and be prepared and be vigilant as we set in order to do so. And then um, with the winds coming today, too, are there any particular areas where you're concerned about trees coming down, power lines? Yeah, all the above. Um, the ground is saturated, um, so I'm concerned uh, about a few things. Uh, one, with the, the saturated uh, soil, um, we'll see uh, more trees come down. We also might see uh, some utility poles as well. Uh, and uh, and that will impact, of course, uh, the power uh, to uh, many residents and, and so forth. So we'll see what happens. Uh, again, we're seeing varying uh, reports. Uh, at first, we thought there was going to be maybe 15 mile an hour winds. Now we're hearing uh, increased winds, uh, depending on which direction the storm uh, takes or what path it takes. So again, that's why I'm. I'm very concerned that people, uh, I want to be sure that we pay attention to this, uh, that this is not over, um, and that's why you have to plan ahead. You know, get everything you need to get done uh, during the day today. Um, so, and, and this it appears it might start, you know, four o'clock or so, uh, and it'd be a quick moving storm. So maybe four to eight and then afterwards, but we'll stay in touch. Uh, we'd ask all of you as well. I know you have uh, meteorologists as, uh, that are assisting, and uh, we just need to, to articulate that uh, to Vermonters so that they can plan as well. But for, for right now, it's 4 o'clock into the evening hours uh, that I'm most concerned, and it's uh, about all the above, whether it's uh, flash flooding, um, whether it's power loss, and trees and utility poles and so forth. Is it, this also might be a question for DPS. Is there an update on um, drinking water conditions or how soon where water notices might be able to lift? Um, so I don't have a specific town by town. It is very different depending upon certain circumstances. We know that um, we've dealt with some challenges. Uh, we have deployed assets uh, to assist with drinking water. Uh, we have uh, also requested in our stockpiling a supply of drinking water uh, through FEMA, uh, and we're prepared to help out. Uh, we've not had a number of requests. We've had a small, uh, I think two is where we are right now, but we are considering that that may be a challenge that we have to deal with. When you say deploying um, assistance, do you mean like state deploying resources to help yeah. How does that work? So uh, one of the requests that we had was a hospital. Um, so we deployed um, some capabilities to uh, uh, deliver water to the system. Um, uh, the specific detail, I don't have the specific details of exactly what we deployed, um, but that was the idea to augment their uh, no drink uh, uh, order for the hospital. Okay. Thank you. 
Does the National Guard, the Mount National Guard, have water trucks? They do, and we've worked with them to make sure that we have those resources aligned. We haven't deployed any of those that I know of, and again, I, I would prefer to the National Guard to tell you more specific details on that. Uh, but we have worked with them to make sure that uh, we are aligned and we know what those resources are. But thus far, we haven't had a need to deploy them yet. Are, are the trucks on standby? Are they ready to go if need be? So I'm going to ask what you mean by trucks. So we have water containment sort of vessels. I'm not, they, they don't drive themselves and we have to pull them around. We have not deployed any of those. They're being inspected right now and they're kind of on standby for if we need that. We do not have water production capabilities. That is something that the Army can do. We don't have those in Vermont. We can ask for those resources if we decide we need them in the state through an EMAC process. Um, from other Army units around the country. Um, that hasn't happened yet. We, we've leaned forward to see where those are available if we do need them. Right now we have just pulled on a team of basically logistics. So they're trucks trucking around bottled and or bagged water that FEMA has brought in. So I think that's what we're doing right now. FEMA has delivered. Um, I don't actually have confirmation that it was delivered, but it was supposed to be delivered about noon today um, at the airfield. We have trucks on standby to deliver them to the towns who have requested them. Could you introduce yourself? I'm sorry, I'm Colonel Tracy Poirier. I'm the director of the Joint Staff for the Vermont National Guard. Thank you. Okay, just add one thing. Uh, I just also wanted to add that we are also working with a number of civilian contractors who do this as well. So we've aligned those resources again, haven't had to use them yet but we're working with them to make sure that we have them in stock and ready to go if that's a need that arises. We have time for maybe one or two more. I just had a question about the state buildings, and maybe this has already been asked or covered, but the, um, there were a number of the DMV, Supreme Court, Ag Agency uh, that were hit hard, from what I understand, Department of Taxes. What's the latest with those and the services that they'll be providing to Vermonters, and what happens with those state employees? I think agriculture uh, building has been spared, um, but uh, Kristen, do you have the rest of those? Sure. So I do have a list of state buildings that have been impacted that I, I can read, but it's rather long, so I'll touch base with you afterwards. Where there, some buildings were impacted more than others, we're hoping that the lesser impacted buildings can be dried out and inspected and come back online. Um, within the next weeks. Um, some may take longer than that, depending on how their systems have been impacted and whether those need to be replaced or whether we can dry those buildings out. And much is to be seen with the weather coming in in the next couple of days. Um, but I do have a list of all of the impacted state buildings. Again, varying degrees of impact. And um, we're working around the clock to try and bring those buildings back online as quickly as possible with a prioritization to the um, service buildings, those who provide services to Vermonters. So the floating bridge basically just capsized? It inverted. Huh. And so it wasn't visible. All right. <clears throat> and, and is it salvageable? For uh, that's being determined now. <clears throat> this might be a question for the Attorney General, but have you received any reports of price gouging? I have not heard of that at this point, but I would refer you to the Attorney General. And have you heard of any shortages of potential goods? Have not at this point in time. Thank you all.